So thank all of you for coming today evening. Am I audible to everyone behind? Can those of you behind me hear me? Behind hear me? Is audible? Okay. okay. So am I is better audible now? Okay, thank you. Skip it. I can go you'll be pressing it? So I'll speak on this topic of how to develop self-confidence. And <clears throat> let me start with the experience about 20, 25 years ago. I was a student like all of you. I was studying my engineering in one of the premier colleges in India. And I had come from a small town to a big city. For, that was the first time I was away from home. At the first time, I was also uh, in an environment. I had, before that, I had always been in an environment where I was always among the toppers, I was among the top five in the class always. But here, I found that all the brilliant students across the country had come, and I was a little overawed. So the first time, I also. I was in college, I also doing some extracurricular activities. So as a part of a elocution club, I used to speak in public in my school, so I decided to continue that. And when I was speaking, when I came for the first time to speak in front of a podium in the college, I had spoken many times before in school. But when I came there, I suddenly felt as if as I was walking up the podium, some voice said to me, you are going to make a fool of yourself. I look around, nobody was there speaking like that. I just tried to neglect the voice. And I continued speaking. Uh, but usually for me, whenever I speak, if I am nervous, then I tend to speak fast. And as my nervousness increases, my speed increases. <laughs> <laughs> so that day, I started off and because I was nervous, I started off very fast. It's like somebody tells you to uh, offers you a lift in a car and even before you have sat in the car, they zoom the car. <laughs> then for most of the audience, it was an experience like that. And then as I saw that people were not paying attention, the people looking at the watch, looking here, looking there. So my nervousness increased and my speed increased. And people were not paying attention because they were not able to catch what I was speaking. And they were not able to catch what I was speaking because I was speaking so fast and I was speaking so fast because I was so nervous and because I was so nervous and I was speaking so fast that they were not able to understand anything and still they were not able to pay any attention. So it just went on at this speed. <laughs> and it just went on like a loop. And I was supposed to give a seven minute talk and I finished in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a total fiasco but after that when I was introspecting I started thinking what was that voice what was that voice that told me that you that said that you're going to make a mess of things and that rattled my confidence so that was the time I started exploring my inner world. I started reading some spiritual texts to understand what all goes on in the inner world. Because I knew, because I was in a competitive environment and self-confidence is always a challenge. Because we often meet people who are better than us in many ways. But this incident, it struck me after that, that actually the real enemy of, of self-confidence is not someone out there is not the conf is not the competition it is something in here some voice in here which sabotages us and when this voice sabotages us what happens yeah. so you know, the crisis of self confidence that is present in today's world is basically this question it starts with the question am i good enough it's a question which the world poses to us and we pose it back to ourselves. It may be in terms of, 
Am I smart enough to get good marks in class? Am I good in, I do, do I, are, my, are my looks good enough? Is my personality good enough? Are my skills good enough? So essentially, am I good enough? And when we get an answer in the negative to that, then at the first level, it makes us start feel inferior to others. And then we get an inferiority complex. When this inferiority complex continues, it leads to depression. Depression can have many specific causes. But essentially, when we get depressed, there is a voice inside us which is constantly discouraging us. We could say not just discouraging us, it is whipping us from within. You are, you are just good for nothing. You are useless. You are not going to do anything in your life. And if we do not equip ourselves to resist this inner voice, this inner voice can beat us even to death. I come from India, which is a very education conscious country. And because of that, there is an enormous amount of competition. So in Mumbai, where also I gave some of my exams, there's a prominent medical college. And in that medical college, there was a student who in seven semesters of her medical studies, she had always been the first, not just in her college, but in her university, in the entire university. And she was extremely good at her studies and she was well on course to coming first in her final exam also. But somehow, a few days, three, four days before her exam, suddenly the thought started going on within her. What if I don't come first? I have got such a reputation. Now everybody knows me as the number one, as the topper. Do you use the word topper here in America? You don't understand it, okay. <laughs> there are some words from Indian English which you may not be familiar with. But you get the point. So she said, what if I don't come first? What if I don't come first? And that voice just went on and on and on in her head. And externally she was going through the motions. But the night before her exam, she locked herself in her room and she committed suicide. For no reason. She would most likely have come first. Because she was so well prepared. But even if she had not come first, she would have come second, third, fourth. That's not a disaster. But what had happened was the external reality was not bad but the inner voice some voice inside her made her feel that that would be a disaster for most students if they come second third fourth that would be an occasion for celebration but for her that inner voice made her seem that it is a disaster so here the lack of self-confidence can even ultimately lead to self-destruction. And <coughs> can you go ahead? So when we have an unsteady, unhealthy reference point. So for her, what had happened was, her reference point was, I need to be first. And from that reference point, everything appeared to be terrible. So there is a book written by... Uh, uh, American Ivy League professor, former professor, it's called Excellent Sheep and describes how in many ways the top education today ends up making students like sheep. So he quotes in that uh, <coughs> student from Stanford, Stanford uh, one of the Ivy League universities, he quotes and he says that the student says that 50% of the time when I was in college, I would feel great because I felt I was better than others. And 50% of the time, I would feel terrible because I felt everyone else was better than me. So this is how our mood swings happen. Where at one level, we may have illusions of grandeur. I am so great. And this comes when we can prove ourselves to be better than others. And if somehow we find that others are better than us, 
then we go to self loathing you know why can't you do this why can't you do this why can't you do this if we the kind of comments about ourselves that our mind can pass if somebody else spoke that to us we would we would feel insulted how dare you speak like this about me but this inner voice speaks like that and we just accept it so what is actually going on in our inner world to develop self confidence yes we can develop skills we can develop abilities we can get better education better degrees but unless we find out what is this voice inside us that is sabotaging us we will not be able to develop self confidence so i will talk about self confidence in terms of an acronym this one below this one more slide go ahead okay if that slide did not get saved this go behind behind so there is a acronym self which i'll be speaking on probably the slide might have gone later so s is spirituality e will be exploration l will be love and f will be faith so what do i mean by spirituality as i said earlier that there is this some voice inside us which seems to work against us at times so what is this voice if we consider that we have a mind and we look at the reductionistic view of modern science and try to understand what is the mind as a mainstream philosopher who said that i refuse to study the mind because the mind has no locus standi you can't locate the mind inside us now yes we can't locate the mind but the mind does have a lot of effect on us if you consider that the world view which we have through science it is very powerful in terms of helping us develop technology by which we can do a lot of things in the outer world but this world view misses out a lot of things in our inner world say for example a great fear that most of us have when we are trying to develop relationships with others is the fear of rejection in fact that is one of the top 10 fears of people in the 21st century mm -hmm. there are two fears which have been newly added to the list of top 10 fears as compared to 20th century or the 19th century one is the fear of terrorists and the other is the fear of rejection now if we are trying to form a relationship with someone and we want to know whether that does this person really care for me does this person really love me with all our technological advancement can we develop some kind of we have thermometers we have barometers can we develop a loveometer you know put the loveometer on the person's heart okay full yeah you love me <laughs> zero hey you don't care for me we can't do that the point here is not to minimize or criticize science the point is to contextualize it that if we want self understanding we can be open to alternative sources of knowledge which illumine the inner world so the yoga texts of ancient india offer us a model of the self that can that includes the spiritual the mental and the physical in one harmonious whole you go ahead so they explain that our self is actually we have uh, it's a three level model the body the mind and the soul so the body if we can compare it to a computer system the body is like the hardware the mind is like a software and the soul is the user as a consciousness if our software gets corrupted by viruses then even if we have a brand new hardware we will not be able to function that's how we see through technology we are physically more comfortable in the past than in the past in fact now even middle class people have comforts that royalty a few hundred years ago did not have we have air conditioning we have telecommunications we have internet we have mobiles so we are physically more comfortable than in the past 
but we are mentally more distressed more miserable than in the past so we could say we are comfortably miserable we are comfortably miserable so what has happened this inner voice which speaks against us this is actually a corruption of the software of the mind just like <coughs> the software is meant to help us use the hardware better and work productively but the virus starts working against our cause similarly inside our mind can there can be voices which speak against us so the lack of self confidence happens because the software of the mind gets corrupted by negative voices now we will try to get a understanding through a thought experiment of this three level model of the self so wherever you are you can now be sit comfortably relax and then you can close your eyes with your eyes closed you can take three deep breaths one breathe in as much as you can and breathe out as much as you can two three now let the deep breathing go on without much effort but gently but deeply you can keep breathing and try to notice your body which part of your body seems to be very tense it may be your feet it may be your hands it may be your forehead just notice whichever part of the body is tense and now we will try to relax the body so you can focus your attention on your right hand and clench that right hand into a fist clench it as tightly as you can and then with the fist clenched take a deep breath and as you release the breath release the fist also as you clench and unclench your fist you will feel your whole body relaxing do this once again clench your fist breathe in deep release the breath and unclench your fist do this one more time clench your fist breathe in deep release the breath and clench your fist now as you can feel your whole body relaxing now try to visualize the fist which you have been clenching and unclenching on your mind's eye you can see something like a inner screen inside you on which various images may come and go as you are observing that try to visualize your fist on that inner screen on that mind's eye and then repeat the same experiment this time instead of focusing directly on the fist focus on the image of the fist that you see in your mind's eye and as you take in a breath tighten the fist release the breath release the fist focus your eyes on the inner screen you can see your muscle is relaxing breathe in tighten the fist loosen the fist release the breath keep your eyes inner eyes fixed on the screen and do this once again relax do this for one last time visualize the fist on your inner screen tighten the fist take in a deep breath release the breath and the fist simultaneously as you let the breath go out of your body 
you can sense all the tension that is there in your body going out. Just feel your body once, take a deep breath and then you can open your eyes. Thank you. So in this thought experiment which you did, are any of you feeling a little more relaxed? How many of you? Yeah, thank you. So in this thought experiment, the purpose was not just relaxation. The purpose was something more. It is, it was introspection. Can you go ahead? Yeah, uh, thought experiment. You already depicted this? Just now. Okay, thank you. So if you see, in the first case, when you were just relaxing the breath and relaxing, tightening the fist and relaxing the fist, you were conscious of the fist. So there is a three level reality you could say. There is the physical scene, there is the inner screen and there is the inner seer. So right now when you are looking at me, I am looking at you. We are part of the outer scene and this outer scene gets projected on the inner screen and that inner screen is seen by the inner seer. If right now you remember, hey, where did I keep my phone? You touch your hand on your phone, pocket and you find a phone is not there, oh, what happened? Where did I keep my phone? I took it, I used it that time, used it there, used it there. So as soon as one thought comes up in your mind like this and suddenly uh, thoughts go in various directions. If the thoughts start going in the inner di various directions, then although you are here in the class, you won't hear what is going on in the class. Because for perception to take place, the inner screen has to be in place. If the inner screen starts showing something else, then Whatever is happening in the outer scene, we can't perceive it. So this inner screen is basically the mind. You, the seer of that inner screen, are the self, the soul. And the physical reality is the outer world. When we suffer a crisis of self-confidence, essentially this inner screen is giving out a negative image. Actually, the inner screen is like a TV. It not only depicts, but it also speaks, also gives out sound. So we might even visualize we making a fool out of ourselves, we meeting with disaster, or we might have a voice telling, you are going to, you are good for nothing, you are worthless, you are going to make a fool of yourself. So this inner screen can be the source of our confidence or it can be the source of our lack of confidence. <coughs> the important thing to understand however is that you are not in the scene nor are you in the screen. You are the seer. You exist safe above your situations and above your emotions. In fact the yoga texts of ancient India, they describe that actually the self, you as a self are indestructible. It is only when you, your consciousness gets caught in the situation or the emotion, that is when we feel threatened. That is when we get overwhelmed. This doesn't mean to say that the outer problems are not real. But like I talked about this girl, who committed suicide, there is no big outer problem. But, so the physical reality was she might come first, she might not come first. But the inner screen started distorting the reality. And thereby, she ended up committing suicide. So by understanding that we are different from this inner voice, we can start catching that voice whenever it starts discouraging us. Whenever we start feeling that, oh, I am not good enough. Then, whenever we 
hear something like this or voice some voice inside us saying it we can just preface it with the mind is saying i am not good enough it's I'm, it's not that i am not good enough the mind is saying i am not good enough hmm? my memory is very poor the mind is saying my memory is very poor whatever it is as soon as you can preface it the mind is saying what happens by that you distance yourself from it and then you can evaluate it if say your friend came and said to you my memory is no good and how would you respond you would not flatter that friend and say that oh your memory is great no but you would not just give in and let the friend get discouraged you would encourage that friend okay but memory is not the only thing that is one thing important but there are other skills also what are you good at so just by prefacing this discouraging voice with the mind is saying we can distance ourselves from it a vital key for developing self confidence is to identify the mind not identify with the mind identify the mind don't identify with the mind so now we may say that okay even if i do this it's not sometimes our mind may worsen aggravate the exaggerate the problem but sometimes there may be a real problem what if everybody is better than me in in my in the academics in their performance in their fluency in speaking in their uh, in their conduct in their behavior in their personality what if the reality itself is discouraging there is one thing which is the voice we identify the voice and we ensure that this voice this mind doesn't make things worse than what they are so that's one level it's important to deal with at that level but the mind may say but no even if you don't exaggerate the reality is bad then how do we deal with that let's go ahead so this is i'll take an acronym s e l f so e was exploration exploration means that we often <coughs> form an appraisal of ourselves based on what the world thinks of us or especially in terms of the qualities that the world glamorizes and based on that the result is that if in the social mirror certain qualities are glamorized and if we don't have those qualities then we start feeling we are not good enough we all may have certain qualities see our self worth we can't see it in the social mirror we have different gifts each one of us has been given gifts but some gifts will be immediately evident they will be recognized by people around us some gifts may not be recognized but sometimes when we give too much emphasis to other people's opinion about us then we cannot look at ourselves objectively we look at ourselves subjectively from the filter of their vision like i so said earlier this girl had a faulty reference point her reference point was if i don't come first that's a disaster in my life well yeah if you can come first it's wonderful to come first but not coming first is not a disaster so just as a faulty reference point blinded her to the good within her to the good the talent that she had the success that she could achieve similarly if our reference point is the world's evaluation of us then that is a faulty reference point which will prevent us from discovering the gifts that we do have when we recognize that okay i i don't have this i don't have this i don't have this but instead of okay what do i really have we put aside the social mirror and look at ourselves this is where if we look at ourselves from a objective perspective then exploring ourselves you know you could you can even look at ourselves from the eyes of a social scientist you know okay who is this person okay i know the name of this person i know this person but look at yourselves from a perspective out of yourself and when we look at ourselves we may discover 
a lot of abilities that we do have. Often, our situation is such that uh, if we go to a program where there is a feast after the program. So, are we having some snacks here after the program? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, sometimes we have a program, after that we have a feast. Say, so now suppose this is a special kind of feast. And in this feast, everybody gets a separate dessert. So, the dessert on my plate will be different from the dessert in your plate, will be different from the dessert in your plate, will be different from the dessert in someone else's plate. So, would any of you like to tell what is your favorite dessert? Anyone? Sorry? Rasmalai. Yes. Ras okay. Thank you. So, Rasmalai, many of you may not know about Rasmalai, uh, but it is it's extremely delicious. Now, when I first <laughs> when I first came out of India about several years ago, I had gone to Australia. And there, one of my friends gave me a, he asked me, would you like to have a baklava? I had never heard of a baklava till then. And if you think of it, baklava is not a very pleasant sounding name. <laughs> <laughs> Bakla, okay. <laughs> so I said, uh, maybe later. Hmm. I didn't take it. And then one of my friends was also there. So we were all eating. And then he took a baklava and started eating it. And he was savoring it, enjoying it. And then I looked at him and said, give me one. <laughs> <laughs> so the point I'm making here is that sometimes we may think, okay, this dessert is very good. But there might be some other dessert, which is also good, but we don't taste it. So imagine that there's a feast in which everybody in their plate has a separate dessert. And you seem to have a dessert which, which you never tasted, which you don't know how it sounds like, you never heard about it also. And you are seeing familiar deserts. Maybe somebody has got a cupcake, somebody has got a very attractive cookie, somebody has got ice cream, somebody has got various other delicious desserts that you know about. And you are looking at, oh, this person has got this, this person has got this, this person has got this. And the more you see everybody else's plates, the more you start feeling dissatisfied. Now, actually, if you look at your own plate, you taste the dessert over there, that is also good. But as long as we are looking at everyone else's plate, we cannot taste and relish what is in our plate. So this exploration means rather than thinking, oh, this, this person has this quality, this person has this quality, this person has this quality, and then minimizing what we have. We objectively look at it, look at ourselves. If you objectively look at ourselves, we will find that if we explore, we can discover abilities that we also have. Satisfaction is not just an emotion that we feel. Satisfaction is also a decision that we can make. Sometimes we just feel, I don't feel satisfied. <coughs> now that's, it's possible a feeling can come. But if I'm looking at the pot is there in everyone else's plate, then naturally I will feel dissatisfied. But if I make satisfaction a decision that I make, that means I look at what is in my plate and I am satisfied with that. And then once I start tasting it, I will find that it is good. And sometimes we may have some delicacies, which you, know, you mix one or two items, sometimes you get a, get a dessert, you can add some more honey in it or some maple syrup in it or something like that and it becomes more delicious. So you can work on what is in your plate and you can make it more delicious. So, in, if instead of looking at ourselves through the social mirror, we look at ourselves in a mood of exploration. Who is this person? Who is this person and what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? We don't have to deny the weaknesses, but we don't have to obsess over them. Just objectively observe ourselves. And this objective observation becomes easier when we have the security of our spirituality. When we understand that I am a spiritual being, I am secure, I am safe, then we can observe ourselves carefully, observe ourselves objectively. Yeah. 
so this self exploration is actually a journey of self discovery suppose you you have some distant grandparent or great grandparent and you come to know that they have in some distant village left an inheritance for you their court their house with a courtyard and you think okay you might just want to go there and have a look at it it doesn't seem to be a very expensive gift and you may think i may use it i may not use it but then if you come to know that actually in the backyard of their house that house which you have inherited a treasure is hidden over there then your whole perspective changes and then you start digging instead of just thinking i should go here and earn some money i should go here and do this i could you start digging in that backyard so so then when you dig you find there is a treasure that you didn't know ex existed similarly for us when we start exploring ourselves at a surface level we may say i know this person but we need to go below the surface below the surface means sometimes there may be certain things which we are good at but because others around us have trivialized those things they never valued those things so because of that we have never noticed those gifts we have never valued those gifts now we are all often pressured by the society around us india as i said is a very education conscious country so once there was a court case between a husband and the wife and they came in for the judge and the husband said that i want my child to become an engineer and the wife said no i want my child to become a doctor so the court the judge said why do you have to come to me for this just ask your child <laughs> said no we can't ask your child both of them said together why not our child is not yet born <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes uh it's not just parents it can be our social circle it can be our friends it can be whichever source it may be the social pressure on us becomes so much that we no longer can see ourselves objectively so self exploration can help us to discover the gifts that we had no, either not known or had overlooked go ahead then a third part is love we are discussing the acronym s e l f so now self love can sometimes be self obsession we are not talking about self obsession over here we have to understand that we are the only resource we have if we are to change if we are made to create a better life for ourselves others can help us but we are our only resource i suppose uh, you got a car and it's a refurbished car and somehow it doesn't move very fast and it doesn't function very smoothly it doesn't look very good also and you may be overall annoyed with the car but if that is the only car you have and then you don't you're not in the position to buy any other car then if you get angry with that car and you take a big iron bar and smash it break it apart the only result of that such aggression will be you will be left without a car so if something is the only resource that we have then whether it is good or bad we will take great care of it so similarly we are our only resource even when others can help us others can encourage us others can guide us but it is we who have to take that encouragement take that guidance take that help so if we keep beating ourselves up with negativity then we are damaging the only resource that we have and then we will not be able to function well now, now certainly this doesn't mean that we become complacent or we become lethargic thinking that oh i don't care what the world thinks about me i love myself it's not like that if I, we, if we could improve our car we will improve our car see loving ourselves does not mean that we have to paint ourselves white it just means that we stop painting ourselves black uh, hating ourselves loathing ourselves means 
we there are there are la there are things which are white within us things which, which are black within us and there are shades of gray but when we loathe ourselves when we hate ourselves at that time we just obsess over the black and overlook everything else in fact we paint everything black <coughs> nowadays we see there is a lot of escapist entertainment hmm? escapist entertainment means that people want to go away from the world get out of the world and escape into some other reality in fact entertainment has been a part of human society throughout thousands and thousands of years ago whatever artifacts we have people have been doing having some sport some recreation that's always been there but what is unprecedented about today is the obsession with the entertainment uh, if you consider who are the professionals who are paid the most it's not doctors it's not lawyers it's entertainers it's entertainers you know uh, a medical surgeon uh, who can fix up a broken leg doesn't even earn one tenth of a person of what a person can person can earn if they can kick a ball with a leg <laughs> <laughs> so now why is it that <laughs> why is it that entertainers are paid so much it is if we consider the economics the law of demand and supply it is because entertainment is felt as such a great need that people are ready to pay anything for it and why is entertainment felt as such a great need because most people can't live with themselves when you want to escape it is not just we are trying to escape from the world we are also trying to escape from ourselves you to escape from ourselves so entertainment is not bad as a as a break from our life it's we can have some entertainment but when entertainment becomes a way to escape from life when we seek entertainment because we find that we can't live with ourselves then that is a dangerous psychological state to be in so loving ourselves means that not that we paint uh, we we don't let ourselves be painted black yes there are defects in me there are limitations in me but this is the only resource i have so self love can become painting ourselves white means not admitting any fault in ourselves just becoming so self obsessed so self centered that we just don't care for anyone else there are some people who are egotists they like whatever you start talking about they start talking about themselves and that's a kind of hearing which is called autobiographical hearing and <laughs> as you tell them you know i went to this country and i saw this site it was so beautiful and they'll interrupt you you know oh i went there and i saw that and they will go on for one hour describing what they're doing so they are self obsessed we're not thinking about that there is narcissism where people just live self centered actually the word narcissism comes from a character narcissus in the greco roman mythology so the idea was that this character was very handsome and he loved to look at himself and that time there are some mirrors but if you want to look at yourself you go in a lake or a river and look at yourself or you go into a sea and look at yourself so he was looking down and he was peering and to look more and more at himself and he didn't know swimming and he just looked down looked down looked down bent down and then finally he fell off into the river and drowned so narcissus narcissistic means that we are so self obsessed patting ourselves on the back that we sink into that pond of self obsession so that kind of self love is unhealthy as i said from uh, the, when i'm talking about self love i'm talking about it's a leading up from the previous point we explore ourselves and when we explore ourselves that same with that same objectivity i understand i am the only resource that i have therefore i will take care of myself one aspect of taking care of myself is that i won't beat myself down another aspect of taking care of myself is also I'll try to fix myself i'll try to improve myself if i have if there is only one vehicle i have if i could improve it in some way i'll definitely improve it so this again 
boils down to we understand ourselves as a seer and look at our software and our hardware look at our body and our mind objectively and see ourselves what can be improved and what can be used as we are so this loving ourselves in a healthy way can actually help us overcome a lot of lack of self confidence because for every ability which we have you know most abilities they have to be worked on to be developed and to work on those abilities we need to have a positive attitude towards them so even if we explore and discover some good ability in us but if we have a overall negative attitude towards ourselves we are loathing ourselves then we won't be able to develop that ability so there is some ability that we discover by exploration and self love means okay this is the resource these are the abilities let me see how i can use them and the last part is f can you go there yeah okay so f is faith and the word faith sometimes has a religious connotation where we think of faith in religious terms and we think of science as dealing with facts and religion as dealing in faith but that kind of division is super simplistic because faith is required in every single walk of life right now all of us are sitting and we are speaking or discussing this thinking about this so much is happening right now which is not in our control which is not even in our awareness we are breathing in air now we are not arranging for the supply of oxygen for ourselves without that air we would not be able to survive for even one moment every day we eat food and we think that okay if i don't work hard if i don't have a job who is going to put bread on my table yes we need to work to get food but what happens after we take the food actually the process by which food is converted into energy it's a whole complicated process researchers are trying to make machines which can take up functions of the body if the bodily part bodily parts are damaged say somebody's arm is damaged you can have prosthetic limb if somebody's heart is not working properly you can have pacemaker if the kidneys are not working you can have a dialysis unit so when people have digestive problems can we make a artificial digestive machine which will digest food for us now there may attempts to do that but what researchers have found is that will require not a digestive machine will require a factory for digestion and not just a factory a chain of factories it's an extremely complex process if we consider work is equal to force into displacement then the sheer amount of work that is required to convert one morsel of food into working energy for us if that whole food goes down through the so elementary canal with the dialectic motions in the elementary canal and all that goes into digestion the work that is required in that it's actually more than the amount of physical work that an average human being performs throughout the day so actually we are hardly involved in it the digestion is a whole complex mechanism that happens without even our awareness the only time we think of about our digestion is when it doesn't work <laughs> mm. so actually our very existence depends on something beyond us a couple of years ago i was invited to cambridge university to speak on science and spirituality so while i was going there we passed by the tree under which newton is said to have seen the fruit fall some people say it fell in front of him some people say it fell on him so wherever it fell uh, it is considered to be the place where science began modern science began how brilliant was newton that just by seeing a fruit fall he came up with the theory of gravity now it's certainly his brilliance but at the same time if we look at the whole picture when he saw the fruit falling he asked a question what made this fruit fall and he came up with the mechanism of gravity as a explanation for that 
but the question itself has an assumption in it. What made this fruit fall? The assumption in that question is fruits don't fall by chance. There is some order in nature. And science essentially is an exploration for discovering the order within nature. Now for Newton himself, it was clear what is the source of that order. He said that, O oh Father, I think thy thoughts after thee. So we may call that divine by that higher agency by whatever name it might be. But even science, for all its scientific discoveries and all its mind-boggling technological advancement, functions based on the faith that there is order in nature. If there were no order in nature, there would be no science. And sometimes, if our scientific uh, exploration makes us find, makes it difficult to find the order in nature then we don't say there is no order we look deeper to find an order when newtonian physics which is called classical physics its foundations were shaken by the study of microscopic ma of fundamental particles or the study of cosmic particles cosmic bodies then science came up with quantum physics to explain the subatomic world and it came up with relativity to explain the behavior of cosmic objects so, but the faith underlying it remained that there is some order in nature. So, the point here is that faith is vital in all walks of life. When we eat food, even if we don't consciously think about it, we have faith that there is something within us which will convert the food into energy. When we study in our laboratories, we have faith that there is some order. So, this same understanding, the Yoga texts take it further and they explain that can you go yeah that we are all parts of a whole bigger than ourselves. We are all parts of something much bigger than ourselves. What does this mean? That we when we think that my self-confidence has to come by becoming the whole, that means I have to become good. In this quality and this quality and this field and this field and this field that's when I'll be successful no we are parts and we simply have to play the part of the part and there is a whole that will take care of the whole when we go to board of plane we're concerned whether we reach on time whether we have our boarding pass whether we have our ID proof but how many of us worry whether the plane has enough fuel or not how many of us worry, what if, the, what if the pilot is drunk too much? We know there is a system that will take care of those things. So just as we understand that the system that will take care of those things, similarly we understand that we are parts of a whole. And the moment we understand that I don't have to become the whole, we will find a huge burden getting lifted from our head. We it's like life is like an orchestra. We don't have to do everything that everybody is doing in the band. We don't have to become like somebody else in the band also. We have to play our part. And it's not that we have to we have to push somebody aside to get a part. There is a space for all of us. If we have the spiritual understanding of life, then we will we will approach life with an abundance mentality, not a scarcity mentality. Scarcity mentality is that, you know, oh, there is only so much of the pie and I have to get the biggest piece. Otherwise, I'll get nothing. No, abundance mentality is at the same hole which is providing me oxygen to breathe right now, which is actually digesting the food within my body. The same hole which has sustained my life for so long, that hole will also provide me direction about the role I am going to play. So when we approach life with this faith that I don't have to become the whole, I just have to play the part of the part, then we will find that by that faith our confidence will rise upwards. Because we will give up the burden 
of needing to become the whole will be able to get the relief that comes from self acceptance and that self acceptance is extraordinarily empowering once we accept ourselves for who we are and we accept that i have to play a part then we can focus on playing the part and we'll find that we will discover levels of talents and levels of energy within us that we did not even know we had and we'll move forward to making our individual contributions and we will not only find satisfaction internally but we'll also be able to make contributions externally so life may often put us in a situation where there is a lot of competition lot of negativity around us but we need we don't know that our self conception doesn't have to be determined by the world if we let, give the world the authority to de determine our self conception we will always be lacking in self confidence but if we turn inwards understand our spirituality and let that spirituality define our self understanding then we will have the self confidence to move forward through life and whatever life may get us to our spirituality will get us through so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on this topic of how to develop self confidence i started with uh, the incident where a voice inside me said that it will make a mess of your pu public speaking and that's what happened thereafter so what was that inner voice i started exploring and i talked about how this inner voice uh, starts with oh, you are not good enough at least inferiority complex depression and even suicide and sometimes that inner voice functions the totally unwarranted reference point like this girl who became fearful that i may not come first and ended up committing suicide so then how do we tell self self confidence i talked about an acronym self does anyone remember what was s spirituality, spirituality. so why explore spirituality because for self understanding we need to understand what is there in our inner world and science looks at physical things but inside us what is there is not necessarily physical so we can't have a love meter because science can't measure quantify that which is non physical so the yoga text offer us a model of the self which is three level what are those three levels do you remember that body body mind mind and soul yeah that's like the hardware software and user and when we lose self confidence it is often because uh, the software of the mind has become corrupted with negativity so we did a thought experiment to visualize how the body is a hand which we clench and unclench the part of the outer scene we can see that on the inner screen but both of them we are beyond it as the inner seer of that so spirituality helps us to understand that we are beyond our situations and beyond our emotions we are secure then e was what exploration thank you so i look at how once we are secure in our spirituality then we can explore our look at ourselves as if we were looking at with a with a social scientist eye and then we may be able to discover that we all have gifts once we stop looking at ourselves from the social mirror we'll find that we have gifts like all of us if we have a plate with distinctive deserts instead of craving for the deserts that we have we learn to savor the des desert that we ourselves have so by self discovery you can find talents which may have been neglected or denied because of what is glamorized in social mirror and then l was what love so i talk about we are our only resource so we need to love ourselves so that we can utilize this resource if that, this doesn't mean that we paint ourselves white and deny our faults it's not self obsession it's not narcissism but it, it is also not a self loathing if i if i have only one car to drive i'll use it as well as i can so by the same objectivity if we learn to love ourselves then we will find that we can utilize whatever abilities we have better and the negativity which will stop us from using our abilities can be removed if we learn to love ourselves and f was faith faith meant that we for our for our very existence depend on something beyond our ourselves 
for whether it is for the air that we breathe the supply of the air outside or even the food that goes inside to digest it we don't know how it happens even science is based on the faith that there is an order in nature which scientific research will discover so this idea of faith is expanded in spirituality by explaining that we are parts of a whole and we don't have to become the whole we as long as we think i have to become the whole we will never have self confidence but as soon as we accept that i just have to play the part of the part and the whole will take care of care of the whole then we can find ourselves relieved of that a burden of being someone who we don't we can't be and then we can just put our energy in being the best that we can be and as we'll find that even if there is negativity around us whatever our life may get us to our spirituality will get us through thank you very much Uh, we do have time for some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes, please. Um, um, so my question is: um, Can we charge this? Yeah, please. Okay. So, uh, what if you have the opposite problem? What if you have too much confidence? Like, you take just too. <laughs> if you have too much, like, what does the yogic text say about that? Good question. So. too much self confidence yeah that is also because of a uh, uh, distorted self understanding some of us may be gifted in such a way that we have a lot of ability that are glamorized in the social mirror or somehow we have acquired a, a conception of ourselves that is that is too white now there are three broad possibilities in it first is that we don't have the don't have much to be proud of but still we are proud that's that is where that is that is just illusion hmm? and that will we are soon in for a big big fall but if we have a lot of abilities and then we feel confident in whatever we do the confidence is good arrogance is not good and the difference between the two of them is primarily in our attitude towards others if we have confidence that means yes i can do this and if i'm not able to do this we'll be able to discover that no i can't do i was not able to do it we accept the mistake and we move on but arrogance means we become dismissive towards others ah, you are good for nothing you are good for nothing you are good for nothing so another aspect of arrogance is that we become dismissive not only of others abilities but also of others opinions we cannot take everyone's opinion seriously but there are our all of us have our friends our well wishers and if they give us some caution that i'm thinking i can do this but there are a lot of problems in this now it's not that the problems should make us stop doing it but we have to be aware of the reality if our confidence is based on uh based on uh, unrealistic assessment of our own abilities or unrealistic assessment of the situation then if there are cautionary voices they can be they can be helpful to us it's it's vital that we have confidence but if we don't dismiss other people's abilities and other people's opinions then that would not be a problem and if we have over confidence then we will crash sooner or later and that can be quite painful in fact the greater the over confidence all that happens by that is by that over confidence we simply increase the height from which we will fall <laughs> <laughs> so it's better that we take others opinions and we not necessarily accept them but objectively evaluate them and then we'll come to a healthier understanding of ourselves is that answer question thank you thank you uh any other question yes please um the question is sometimes in life we are we understand that we are on the road of our own we tend to in general uh, conversation we tend to abuse our own resources meaning uh abuse to ourselves our abilities uh spouse uh, yeah. siblings um, things like that we we tend to be hard on ourselves more than what we appreciate so how do we get out of that ground okay so if we have some abilities but we are too hard on ourselves 
we abuse ourselves, we abuse the people around us. Yeah. Generally, this happens when <coughs> we have set too high an expectation for ourselves or too high an expectation from, for others. And then we are not able to meet that expectation. So then we start beating ourselves up because of that. So now ex having expectations is just natural, it's human. And in many ways, it is helpful. So when we are going to face a situation, are going to enter into a situation, having expectations can help us to shape that situation. So if you're going to do a project, then having expectations, I want, to, I want to do it at this level of excellence. That can help us to work hard and do the needful. But sometimes the expectations, so we are here, the expectations are here and the reality is here. Like I talked about three levels, see here, see screen and scene. So the expectations are present in the screen mm -hmm. and we are the seers. And then the scene is the reality. So the expectations can help us to transform the reality in a positive way. But sometimes the reality is such that it is radically different from our expectations. And at that time, say we are here, the reality is here and the expectations are somewhere here. And all our energy is going and dealing with the expectation. But the expectation is not connecting with the reality at all. So why are things not like this? Why are things not like this? Why are things not like this? That doesn't help us to deal with the reality. A simple example to illustrate this. Say somebody decided to learn rowing. And then they practiced and then they called all their friends and relatives that I'm going to do a demonstration of my rowing skills. And they enter into the sea uh, with a boat, with oars and they plan gracefully I'm going to move my hands and people will click photos and they put it on my Facebook pages and I'll enjoy watching it all. And then as they are rowing, suddenly from nowhere a monster wave comes. And that wave knocks over and now there is no boat, there are no oars. And still in their mind, they, oh, I wanted to do this. And they're still moving their hands <laughs> as if they're rowing. They do that, they'll simply sink at that time. So, at that time, if the reality has changed so much, then one has to accept, okay, I can't row now. I have to just first get back to the land now. Just start swimming and get back to the land. So, so similarly, some, so what happens is the, the reality is here, the expectations are somewhere here. And if we keep dealing with the expectations and then that obstructs us from dealing with the reality, then we hurt ourselves. So when we abuse ourselves or when we abuse anyone else, it is because of the big distance between the expectation and the reality and we are just beating the, ourselves, why am I not here? Why is the reality not according to the expectations? But after some time, when if reality has changed, if the expectations are coming in the way, we need the psychological flexibility by which we can distance ourselves from our expectations. Having expectations is natural, but being attached to the expectations is a problem. So psychological rigidity means that this is the way I think and this is the way things should be. Psychological flexibility means that I can distance myself. Okay, I was thinking like this, but now the reality is like this. So I'll stop thinking like this. I'll look at this and deal with it. So if we develop the psychological flexibility to, to, to accept reality, even if it is distant from our expectations, then we will be able to give up that tendency to abuse ourselves or abuse others. Now that doesn't mean we just quit. It just means that we recalibrate. If our expectations can help us to shape the reality positively, then we can celebrate. But if the expectations are simply coming in the way of our dealing with reality, because the reality has changed so drastically, then we need to recalibrate. Okay, how do I deal with this reality now? So when we learn to do that, that's why I conclude by talking about self-acceptance. Self-abuse is simply a very aggressive expression of a vehement reluctance to accept oneself. So once we expect our, accept ourselves, okay, this is what I thought I was, but this is where I am right now. I accept myself, then I can work to elevate myself, to change myself, to change my reality.
Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So thank all of you for your attention and participation. Thank you very much for coming here. And I have a few books, if any of you would like to have a look. We have these books behind. So this is Demystifying Reincarnation. I mentioned about this three-level model of the self. So that is the scientific pointers towards that in the sense of near-death experiences, past life memories and consciousness studies, as well as description of answers to common questions. If there is something called reincarnation, why can't we remember our past lives? What determines what kind of life we'll get in the future? Are there things like ghosts and spirits? These questions are answered in this book. And you also have inner change. This is 121 reflections from a yoga text called the Bhagavad Gita. They explain how we can do introspection for improving ourselves. The searching I. This is deals with spiritual wisdom applied to social issues, depression, suicide, religious violence, gender discrimination, <coughs> these kind of issues. How spiritual wisdom can help us to deal with that is described in this book. And we also have 10 leadership sutras based on the yoga text Bhagavad Gita. In the corporate world, in the competitive corporate world, how can we apply principles of spirituality? That's explained here. We also have, do we have Mind It? It is there. You don't have to get it. There's one book called Mind It. Much of what I talk on the mind today, that you'll find in that book Mind It, 64 reflections for better understanding how our mind can trick us and how we can deal with it. This is science and spirituality. This comes how science and spirituality can be two distinct domains of knowledge. Both of us can empower us during our life journey. So if any of you want any of these books, they are there. We also have some meditation cards. Do we have them? There are some 365 meditation cards based on the wisdom from the Bhagavad Gita. They are available as a card deck. You could keep that on your desk and that can give you something for reflection and inspiration. Or you could give it as a gift to somebody who you know is a little depressed or going through some negativities and it can help them. Thank you very much. Great.